we all want to know the future. I want to know if I'm going to have a heart attack or if my mom will develop symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Predictive models allow us to answer a lot of these questions. However, predictive models are only as good as the data we use to train them. This is a problem in lots of different scientific disciplines. For example, predictive models are used in the criminal justice system to predict who is likely to commit a second offense. In 2016, ProPublica published a paper um, looking to see how accurate these models actually are. And they looked at the individuals who are labeled as high risk for committing a second offense. Now, they first looked at white individuals who are labeled high risk, and they found that 75% of them actually went on to commit a second offense. So the model seems to be working pretty well, and it's pretty accurate. However, they looked next they looked at the African American individuals who are labeled high risk and found that only 45% of them went on to commit a second offense, less than half. So this model isn't accurate, and it's less accurate for the African Americans. This happens because the data used to train the model overrepresents white individuals. So the model actually learns to do a better job at making predictions for the white individuals. In order to solve this problem, we either need to get data that's more representative, or we need to measure the differences between the data used for training and the actual population in the US that we wanna learn about. This example is a perfect analogy for problems we're facing in medical research today. My research is focused on predicting who will develop symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And we wanna do this using a predictive model. And we wanna do this with clinical trial data because we have a lot of it from all of the clinical trials we've run. However, um, people have to uh, volunteer to be a part of clinical trials. And it's been shown that clinical trials tend to overrepresent white individuals. And so with current predictive models, we would get the most accurate predictions for white individuals. Again, just like we got the most accurate predictions for white in individuals in the criminal justice example I gave you earlier. My research is focused on measuring the differences between the clinical trial participants that we have and the population of all elderly adults in the United States that we wanna learn about and accounting for these differences. This will allow us to obtain more accurate predictions so that when you or I go to the doctor, we can trust the predictions that we receive. Thank you. Hello, ARCS Foundation members and fellow ARCS scholars. My name is Amanda Cullen, PhD candidate in the Department of Informatics in the Donald Brent School of Information and Computer Science. This presentation, Gendered Stereotypes, Harassment, and the Work of Video Game Live Streaming, focuses on an aspect of my dissertation examining the experiences of women who work as video game live streamers. In order to understand differences in labor, personal expression, and sociality in online gaming contexts. The online gaming context I focus on in this presentation is the live streaming platform Twitch.tv. Twitch is a site like YouTube that is filled with user-generated content, but the focus on Twitch is live performance with real-time communication between a streamer and a set of viewers. There are over 3 million streamers on Twitch and the platform has an average of 15 million daily visitors. The content of channels on the site, like those seen here, are largely video game focused and many of the social norms and behaviors on the site are derived from those found in video game culture. Live streaming is an explosive sector of technology and communications industry growth, as well as a prominent facet of the billion dollar video game industry. Video game live streaming is also becoming one of the most influential ways that technology users interact with digital media and online communities. And I'll also add, that the events of the past few months have highlighted the importance of online sociality infrastructure and live streaming platforms. Live streaming offers valuable opportunities for players and viewers to express themselves, form interpersonal connections, and develop social and technical skills. However, on Twitch, the ubiquity of norms and attitudes prevalent in video game culture, like meritocracy and misogyny, make it difficult for women to take advantage of opportunities in the same way. In fact, I argue that heightened opportunities for success and visibility offered by live streaming platforms, as well as their reproduction of values inherent in video game culture, create an environment where the participation of women is often evaluated according to gendered stereotypes. My dissertation is an ongoing digital ethnography using multiple methods, such as surveys, 
discourse analysis, participant observation, and interviews. This combination of methods allows me to observe behavior and communication in natural settings, to question participants directly, and to highlight issues in the cultural context around live streaming. Through over 100 hours of participant observation on live streams and an analysis of dozens of threads and streamer forums like this one, I have documented many examples of women encountering sexist remarks in rhetoric while performing the work of live streaming. And this rhetoric is often intended to devalue or limit participation from women. Furthermore, the results of a survey I administered to 267 current and former Twitch streamers confirmed that the majority of them have experienced some form of harassment, and that for women, this harassment primarily took the form of uninvited comments about their appearance. Gendered harassment like these are part of the environment of streaming that women must contend with in their work and social lives as streamers. In the next several months, I will begin a series of semi-structured interviews with streamers, viewers, and Twitch employees in order to gain nuanced perspectives on gender, labor, and harassment in live streaming. This summer, I will be working as an intern at Twitch, assisting them in the development of tools and frameworks for addressing problematic behavior on the platform that will hopefully have broader implications on other platforms online. So what my dissertation is trying to do, in part, is to reveal how the work in the play of live streaming is different for women and to demonstrate how knowing these differences is crucial for mitigating and preventing the spread of harmful behaviors online, as well as understanding the complexity and nuances of life online. I would like to conclude by thanking the Twitch community and the streamers who have participated in my research, past, present, and future. I'd also like to thank my advisors, Dr. Bonnie Ruberg and Dr. Aaron Trammell, as well as the members of the CATS Lab. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Kate Ringland, ARC Scholar alumna, for her terrific mentorship. And finally, I thank the ARCS Foundation and Twitch Interactive for their generous support of my research. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Dan Gardner, and I'm a PhD candidate in informatics and a second year ARC scholar. Today, I will be talking a little bit about my research and some of the things I've been able to do the last two years because of the support I've received from ARCs. At a high level, I study how different values and systems of authority materialize in technology and media, especially in video games. In my research, I rely on information in computer science, social science, and media studies to examine digital and physical interfaces that mediate various broader cultural concerns. The three primary areas I'm concerned with are security and surveillance, representation and inclusion in games, and accessibility and design constraints. I'll only be talking about uh, representation and accessibility today. Representation across media has been an increasingly important topic in popular and academic discourse the last decade, especially as it pertains to race and gender. In films, criticisms, scandals, and memes related to representation have been regular news. Digital games have similarly struggled with racial and gendered representation since their inception. In my work, I contribute empirical grounding to claims of poor representation in games and work to develop new methods for measuring representation more inclusively, intersectionally, and collaboratively. This chart comes from a paper I published on the largest census of playable characters yet published. It shows the probability of who players may enact in the games in my sample that have a single default character. These are games where players have no choice over who they will play as. Because my data is focused on playable characters, it highlights certain inequalities players may experience taking on these characters. For example, when any feminine player of color sees that they are more likely to take on the role of a masculine green character than someone who looks like their own non-fictional selves, it highlights certain inequalities and trade-offs that some players must accept to participate in gameplay compared to, for example, a masculine white player who is significantly more likely to encounter a character that looks like them. The menus that comprise character selection and customization inherently narrow the field of representation rather than diversify it. Limitations on body types, skin tones, hairstyles, and other physiological and cosmetic features in character creation represent the limits on who games are permitted to be about in a way that isn't as clearly or structurally observable in previous mediums. The other topic I'll discuss today, accessibility, is often about how users or players can or cannot access, use, or play with technology. Or, as it is sometimes put, is a mismatch between capac the capacities of a user and the features of a technology. 
In the field of human-computer computer interaction, we have principles such as universal design, which, depending on who you ask, is either about designing for the most amount of people possible or the most generous average of the population. Or, perhaps more critically, designing for uh, those with the least access or the most mismatch at the far ends of the curve, recognizing that it will only benefit those with more access. What makes accessibility and design constraints so interesting in games is that what constrains designers and what may limit player accessibility are often embodied by the same device, the controllers games are played with. In my work, I am right now finalizing data analysis on a large historical collection of controllers to describe the evolution of controller design over time. This data allows me to examine the normative assumptions about physical capacities of players built into these devices and helps me ask questions about when controllers constrain or can inspire game design. But why study these social implications of interfaces? Well, the primary reason is because they dictate player access and in-game experiences in important ways. The scholar Miguel Seedcart describes, uh, in a sort of crass way, we might consider that the only actual activity we participate in digital games is whatever we're doing with our fingers. He writes somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but that we don't feel in games, we press F to feel, to highlight how controllers are an important part of how we connect and interact with games. And more broadly, this highlights the need to investigate other interfaces between us and our digital media. To begin to wrap up, this is just a list of conferences I was able to attend or uh, because of ARCs, uh, all, of, all of one of which I was presenting at or supporting presentations on research that I advised. Speaking uh, of advising, another cool thing I got to do was help these amazing women. This is a group of undergrads that I've been advising in the last two years uh, all over the country who have already produced two publications with another one in review right now at a top tier journal. I have another team I've been advising for almost a year, but uh, our chance to get a picture got canceled because of COVID-19. They also presented a poster at uh, this year's iConference as well, virtually. I would not have been able to help either of these teams uh, as much as I have without the support I received from ARCS. So ARCS has actually supported them as well indirectly. And finally, while I don't need a, didn't need a new computer the last couple of years, my daily driver scooter of 10 years finally died last year. And because of ARCS, I was able to replace it almost immediately, which was an enormous help across the board for me in terms of gas money saved and just general access to life. So thank you again for all of your support and have a lovely day. My name is Paul Kurth and I am a PhD student at UCI working with Michael Ferentz. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research uh, supported by the ARCS Foundation. So one of the big questions that security researchers are interested in answering is what operations are allowed when you try to access a resource? Uh, for instance, are you allowed to reach in the cookie jar and take a cookie? My research is focused on the application data that is resident in your computer's memory and how it should be used. Modern processes are composed of several cooperating components. These components all have a uniform ability to access the memory of the application and modify or change its data depending on their uh, operating system permissions. In some sense, this architecture trades performance for security because while it is very fast, it provides no isolation. In a more ideal world, we'd have a memory layout that looks something more like this where each component's memory is completely isolated from one another. In practice, this is nearly impossible because components generally share memory resources with one another to do the work that they need to do. This is further compounded when one of the components might be less trustworthy than the others. It might not be malicious, but a bug or vulnerability within that component might allow an attacker to access or modify data it should never have been able to access in the first place. So people have been thinking about this problem for quite a while, and Intel has developed some new hardware called memory protection keys that allows, uh, that allows us to very quickly remove access to certain regions of the application memory. So we can effectively build a sandbox around this untrusted component so that whenever it runs, its ability to access unrelated memory is disabled. And its view of 
the process memory now looks something like this, where it can only access resources it should have been able to touch in the first place. PKRE Safe is our implementation of this idea. I had instruments the interface between trusted and untrusted components in the Rust language. It has low runtime overhead, and it can be deployed, deployed automatically with only minor changes required by any developers. As we move forward with this research, we're working on ways that we can make the defense more fine-grained and isolate each individual component. I'd like to take this time to thank the ARCS Foundation for its generous funding. It has allowed me to attend several security seminars and symposiums, including the Network and Distributed System Security Composing Symposium, the Usenix Security Symposium, and has also allowed me to purchase a variety of desktop and computing hardware that my research relies upon. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful day.